After the Japanese occupied Malaya, they anticipated that the region would eventually be isolated and blockaded by enemy forces. So the Grow More Food campaign was introduced. This was to ensure that Sionan was self-sufficient enough to feed itself and the military. The agricultural department distributed seeds and allocated land for the cultivation of food crops. Available land in public spaces, like football fields and playgrounds, was converted to vegetable plots. Even the padang was not spared. Plantations were cleared to make way for the growing of food crops. Seperti di siglap ini, segala bekas uh, ladang kita atau kebun kita di Frankel Estate dan siglap ni berubah terus ditebang, ditebas, ditroke, terus dijadikan kebun sayur. Walaupun budinya kebun sayur dengan lambang nanas, tetapi yang ditanam adalah keperluan-keperluan makanan seperti ubi, keladi, Kledek, jagung, yang mengikut sistem tanaman modern, sama ada gunakan traktor, gunakan baja, gunakan segala alat-alat pembunuh kuman serangga dan sebagainya, yang mana hasilnya benar-benar uh, mengagumkan. So in the beginning, I think the approach was a softer approach, so where they tried to encourage populations to grow uh, their own food. Um, they had. Um, you know, made all kinds of slogans. They introduced gardening uh, in local schools as part of the school curriculum, right? So you had students who were actually involved in, um, you know, growing little plots, vegetable plots in their, in their school premises, right? You had government workers who were involved in this. You had prisoners, prisoners of war who were involved in this as well. In fact, I think it was mandatory for government workers to spend at least four hours a week working in their plots, right? And if you didn't do that, it would be seen as subversion. I'm Ivy Singh. I'm a 63-year-old Singaporean. I'm the owner of Bollywood Veggies. Bollywood Veggies is a beautiful 10-acre lifestyle farm. I'm a baby boomer, you know, so I never lived through the Japanese occupation. I'm the lucky generation. But from the stories I hear from older people, uh, I think the what happened was there was so much devastation uh, with bombing, etc. And uh, people, a lot of the men were killed, so they don't even have enough people who work in the fields. Uh, and uh, simply, people's lives were all overturned. And so the growing of food, I suppose, was interrupted, which was the main uh, occupation of the community then, the farmers. So if you overthrow the farmers and nobody grows food, I think people would just forage and eat whatever they could. By 1944, the food supply was decreasing. The soft approach to being self-sufficient was not working. So the Japanese reduced food rations, and they created two farming colonies outside Singapore to provide the Sionan population with alternative food supplies. So Sinjapo 
他又有米派嘛，没有就没有得吃啦。为什么会有这样多人搬进来这边？日本时代，因为那个死死亡铁路啊，他们新加坡要抽那那日本要抽那青年啊，去坐那条铁路，然后他们父母有钱啊，他接触他们的新加坡的财产啊、生意啊，搬回来。这边住，那么你有有搬进来这边住，你的儿子都不必愁着了。我们进到来这边呢，这个新村啊，他有起那种长屋啊，好像印尼那种长屋给我们住，然后吃的东西呢，全部是政府在煮煮来大大桶饭给我们吃，然后吃了三个月，他就分发给你。分那个地啊，给你去种，你自己去，自耕自吃。种种一年种一次来，可以吃一年，没有卖的，自己吃的，没有了啦。以前很辛苦的，你跟人家做工哦，三块钱一天才呀，跟人家除草啊什么啊，男人才五块才呀。那以前种稻子很辛苦。因为他他那个巴车才开辟啊，很多树头啊，除又除不到，哪一次咯，插秧咯，这样咯。这后来啊，种木薯啊，番薯啊，到一年才一次嘛。It is not about farming skills. It is a love for land and a love of nature. I was brought up loving the land and knowing that if I put seeds in the ground, it's going to grow into something. If I grow a fruit tree, it's going to give me fruit. If I grow herbs, I can use it in my cooking. It's, it's knowledge of your surrounding, knowledge of geography, knowledge of nature. So you learn the reality of the land and life around you. Endau was successful as a model farm. But Bahau, a settlement for Eurasians and Chinese Roman Catholics, was a different story altogether. I'm Joe Consensio. I'm 88 years old. I was born in 1924. I had been called to the Japanese headquarters in, in, in North Bridge Road or someplace like that. I went into the Japanese person's office. And he, he told me, sit down. Then he said, you, I think you better go to Bahau. So that was a kind of, not, not, not a request, but an order. We never knew how to farm, which is really a kind of concentration camp which the Japanese put the Eurasians in. So they gave us a plot of land, big, very big plot of land. Which, is, which we found was quite unproductive. In fact, there was a group of Chinese settlers who had moved through, and they called, them, they called it Boho. Boho in Chinese means no good, you see. Well, after we arrived there, uh, we, we had to be supplied with food because we, we, we hadn't started our own uh, uh, sort of farming yet. So they, they provided with rice, a small, portions for each family. A lot of people were spreading rumors, oh, so-and-so died, so-and-so passed away, you know? And finally, one day, um, this is a, a memory, one day somebody came and told my mother that my grandmother had died, right? And my mother was such a shock. She was so, um, she was so heart, heartbroken, she was so upset, you know, stressed out, because she thought that if she had gone, maybe grandma wouldn't have died. So then she went to somebody, some important person in, in, in among the Eurasians, and he said, nonsense, it's not true. She's okay. So he brought her, showed her this cutting from the newspaper. This part says a picture of a happy Eurasian family outside a temporary homestead in Bahau. And the people who died were the old people. My grandfather died there and I had to bury him. And it was a, it was a horrible experience, you know, burying someone, someone who had died. So we, we used to 
make coffins ourselves, just knock planks together, make a coffin, and then put it at, at the side of the bed or so, so. And we used to take a long piece of wood and push the the corpse because they were full of ants. We don't want to, and the the corpse would fall into the coffin, and all the ants would be splayed all over the place. And then we'd take cover the coffin and take them, bury it ourselves. Bahao failed because the middle class Eurasian population who were sent there knew little about agriculture. But even for those who could farm, the soil conditions were poor and it was malaria infested. Around 3,000 people settled in Bahao, but by the end of the occupation, between 500 and 750 died. The exact figures are not known. For Singapore, if you look at the death rate, right, for the periods 43, 44, 45, there was a spike in the death rates and lots of people died and much of it had to do with, with uh, lack of access to basic food. But in a kind of ironic way, if you look at the diet that people were forced to consume during the Japanese occupation, it was ironically a healthy diet because it was low in fat, low in meat. You know, they were largely consuming fruits and vegetables, right, that they had grown. Uh, you know, this is kind of organic farming, right? You know, you're growing your own food uh, free of pesticides and just using natural fertilizers. So ironically, the food that people were eating that they could grow and had access to was ironically healthy food. Today we're making a dish of lemak sweet potatoes and kangkong. Now lemak means coconut rich. This recipe is from the book Wartime Kitchen and it was contributed by Kathleen Woodford of the Eurasian Association of Singapore. So I'm just gonna peel my sweet potatoes now and then slice the potato into bite-sized cubes. And kangkong and sweet potatoes were actually two of the most commonly available vegetables because they were cheap and easy to grow. Three to four chilies, depending on size. So we're using about four shallots. So I'm going to transfer them to the pestle and mortar and then pound them into a coarse paste. So I'm going to rinse some dried shrimp or hebi and then add them to the mortar and pound them together. They are essentially small whole shrimp that have just been sun-dried and they add a lot of savouriness and flavour to a dish. And the use of a few highly flavoured ingredients to make a dish very tasty is not just an example of wartime thrift, but of Asian ingenuity in general. Now we're going to fry the spice paste in hot oil as the first step of assembling the final dish. Now I'm going to add the coconut milk. Okay, I'm going to add the sweet potatoes. This needs to simmer for around 15 minutes until the potatoes are just tender. And then we're going to add the kangkong. And season it with salt and the dish will be done. And here's the completed dish. Lemak sweet potatoes and kangkong. In the absence of meat, wartime cooks had to maximize taste and nutrition from available vegetables, beans, and carbohydrates. Clever use of available ingredients gave birth to innovative recipes that filled empty stomachs. After the occupation, Singapore continued to rely on overseas supplies of wheat, rice, and dairy but it also maintained a farming industry that produced vegetables and poultry. This continued up to the 1960s. People in charge of communities must understand. You can give your community all the money in the world, right? And all the housing in the world. But if they don't have food sustainability, they have no connection to the land, they are not going to survive, right? So it is critical to understand that food sustainability, uh, self-sustainability and connection to the land are connected. 
During the war, an urban population was forced to become farmers. Although it was a struggle, they managed to feed themselves and their families with what they grew. The land offered sustenance and nourishment to the wartime population. Today, as more of land-scarce Singapore is taken over for commercial and residential purposes, self-sufficiency and feeding ourselves becomes an increasingly pressing issue. How would Singapore cope if our food supply is ever exhausted? Can we go back to the land?